We've all heard of strange laws and standards. Everybody has that friend of a friend with the scoop on some bizarre regulation. But how many of these are true? And how many are mere urban legends? Today, we're going to become experts at spotting illegal pickles and learn about some of the most bizarre food regulations that exist. Not only are they totally outrageous, they're 100% true. Sit back, relax, but maybe hold off on grabbing yourself a snack. Some of the things that are about to be described are a little less than appetizing. Amazing. Those of you cool kids with a deep knowledge of pickle regulations will often use this upcoming law as an anecdote or as fodder for some kind of joke. But rest assured, legislators are 100% serious when it comes to enforcing it. According to the Food and Drug Commission of Connecticut, not all brined cucumbers can be rightfully called a pickle. Even though they might look the same to the standard consumer, not all pickles are created equal. Just check out Pickle Rick. Think you can tell the difference? What do you think the regulation is? Maybe you think you already know everything you need to know about pickles. Well, I've got the test just for you. Take a look at these two and comment below which one you think is illegal. Leave a comment now to let me know which is the purest pickle and which one is the imposter. Go ahead, pause the video. While you're at it, make sure you drop a like and share this video. I'll wait. Did you catch that? It's a minor difference, but it's important if you're going to sell pickles in the state of Connecticut, or really anywhere else for that matter. One of the acidified cukes bounced and the other did not. The one that bounced is legal. The other would be illegal by Connecticut standards and almost anywhere else, really. Are you confused? Don't worry about it too much. This little idiosyncrasy of Connecticut has been the source of much bemusement and humor over the years. And though the story is often misrepresented, there's a lot of truth behind it. So where did this strange story or law come from? Has anyone ever faced consequences for bounce-free pickles? And what happens to pickles that don't bounce? The answers may surprise you. And they come from an article published in 1948 by the Hartford Current with a straight to the point headline. The original article stated that pickle packers Sidney Sparer and Moses Dexler were arrested for selling pickles unfit for human consumption. The Food and Drug Commissioner for Connecticut was Frederick Holcomb at the time. The article references his unusual method of testing pickles. He was quoted as saying that the boring run-of-the-mill lab tests were adequate for testing pickles. However, the statement that captured the imaginations of people for years to come stipulated that a simpler test is to drop it one foot and it should bounce. When the illicit preserves packed by Sparer did not, the hapless pickler was arrested and months later pleaded no low contendery, which means he accepted the conviction without admitting guilt. On top of that, he was hit with a $500 fine and the 10,000 gallons of pickles his company owned were destroyed. This was the maximum fine that could be charged by law at the time. His official charge was for violating the State Food and Drug Act, a statute concerning adulteration and misrepresentation of food products. Although lawmakers didn't specifically debate the viability of a bounceability test and then write it into the rule books, Holcomb's rudimentary method is an appropriate way to distinguish superior pickles from illegal ones. Further investigations concluded that the pickles Spare and Dexler packed had been in the vats for at least two years prior to federal inspectors getting involved. Pickles last a maximum of two years, so it's no surprise the laboratory described them as putrid, decomposed, and containing rat tail maggots. They also gave off a stench. Unsurprisingly then, when they were exposed to the one foot drop test, they simply splatted instead of bounced. That is indicative of an inferior product for sure and one that's definitely in violation of food safety laws. The hang up on bouncing appears to be based on Holcomb's thoughtless word choice and it's stuck. What's quite shocking about this case in particular was that the firm processing the pickles were using alum, which is a type of salt dissolved into the pickling solution in their processing of the cucumbers. Alum is used to stiffen the pickles, making them crunchy, and it also brings out the warts on the skin of the cucumbers. Not only were the pickles still mushy despite this additive being added, according to the FDA, alum is also toxic in large quantities, which is why today it's rarely used. In fact, until 1986, it was perfectly legal to pack vegetables in another compound, sulfites. This was despite the fact that sulfite, 
which is a salt of sulfurous acid, are known to cause asthma attacks. Fortunately, its use has since been banned, but not after many people got sick after eating salads laced with sulfides. Some people even died. If it takes illnesses and deaths for an additive to be banned, it kinda makes you nervous to think about what still is allowed. This leads us onto the subject of food laws and regulations in general. How many bizarre ones are still out there? And are there still dangerous additives added to our food that we just don't know about? Well, going back to Connecticut, up until 2011, farmers were prohibited from selling any products they'd processed themselves. All across the state, you could stop by roadside farmer's stands or go to a farmer's market, but if you saw homemade sauces, sauces, or firm and bouncy pickles for that matter, they'd be illegal even if their quality was higher than those sold at the supermarkets. Residential farmers were allowed to sell a good deal of produce they picked directly from the source, but if they altered the produce in any way, they were breaking the law. Part of the reason it took so long for the law to change was that large food suppliers didn't want the extra competition, so they lobbied government officials to convince them that foods processed by small-time producers may be hazardous to consumers. The law has since changed as long as growers first pass a food safety course, but they are still prohibited from processing high-risk foods that include milk, eggs, meat, poultry, or fish. What's interesting is just how specific and detailed food regulations are. You may be surprised to hear that the food you buy has specific processing criteria it must satisfy before the FDA deems it fit for human consumption. In fact, before being processed in boiling water, highly acidic foods like pickles must have a pH of between 4.20 to 4.60. This acidity combined with the heat will inactivate any potentially dangerous bacteria and spores that may be present. And the pH rules for hundreds of different foods are very specific, as detailed by the FDA. There's an irony in all this that some people are all too happy to point out. It's that the federal government is actually pretty relaxed about what can and can't go in your food. Hopefully you're not eating, aren't about to eat, or haven't eaten within the past few minutes, as what you're about to hear may put you off your food. Guidelines state, as long as it's under a certain percentage, some non-food items are allowed into certain types of food. These are known officially as food defect action levels and are published online by the FDA. For instance, whole black and white pepper permits 1% or less of pickings by weight being contaminated by foreign matter. So what is foreign matter? Well, by definition on its website, it includes matter such as sticks, stones, burlap bagging, cigarette butts, and raw plant materials such as stems. Mmm, yummy. Then there's the generally gross, like mold and rodent hair. Finally, there's the downright disgusting like maggots, insect eggs, and feces from both animals and insects. Pass me over some of those canned tomatoes so I can potentially get five fly eggs and one maggot per 500 grams. I know it sounds disgusting, but the truth is there's always going to be contamination in one form or another, and these guidelines are simply realistic thresholds for food safety. What's particularly strange is there are a lot of artificial ingredients the FDA still allows in food products that might be more damaging than a few fly eggs or maggots. For instance, food dyes like the artificial coloring red number three. This vibrant dye is the source of the appealing color of maraschino cherries and is also used in some jellies, jams, and snacks. But is it so appealing to know that it's been shown to cause cancer in animals? Or how about that it isn't even legal to include in lipstick? Kinda makes you think twice given that it's only partially banned by the FDA, despite most of the rest of the world outlawing it. Luckily, you'll rarely find it as companies are using Red 40 instead. This additive is particularly prevalent in the cereals, candies, sodas, and snack foods pitched to kids. It's much safer, but some limited studies have linked it to increased hyperactivity in children. Even so, there's a lot more additives you should be aware of. Take for instance, caramel coloring class three and four, the colorant frequently used in soft drinks, especially colas. Though legal around the world, some states like California have banned it for being included in the category of chemicals known to cause cancer or reproductive toxicity. While some evidence, like a two-year study on mice, have shown it increasing rates of certain lung tumors in small doses, it seems safe. The good news is companies do seem to be reducing the amount of harmful additives used in our food and drinks. 
So overall, it is promising to know that there's an authority out there to protect us from hazardous food that's potentially unfit for human consumption. Whether it be a mushy pickle or a refreshing soda, you should now be more aware of the stringent, yet sometimes bizarre, food and drink regulations. Are you surprised by anything you learned? Would you feel safer knowing your food bounced? Or where do you stand on the issue of allowing maggots into your food? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below, and thanks for watching.